Uh, so welcome to this uh, webinar. Um, my name's uh, Ian Green. I'm the Customer Relations Lead for Europe for Snowbin International, along with the Global um, Clinical Engagement Lead. Um, I'm joined by my colleague from SNOMED, um, Dr. Charles Guttridge, uh, who's the Clinical Lead for uh, EMEA. And we're joined this evening by uh, Dr. Di Evans, um, who is a uh, practicing GP uh, from the UK, but I'm going to let Di introduce himself um, and tell you about the subject of this evening's presentation. So with that, I'm going to hand over to you, Di. Okay, thank you. Hopefully this will all work. Um, yeah, so far so good. Um, evening, everybody, wherever you are. Um, so I'm Di Evans, I'm a uh, GP, uh, in Stoke-on-Trent, Central UK, urban practice, 10,000 patients. Um, and the practice itself, uh, we transitioned from uh, our legacy terminology, <coughs> read version two, to SNOMED last year. I'm also lead clinical advisor at um, uh, a business unit at the University of Nottingham, which uh, is heavily involved into um, data quality, data specifications, uh, audit, um, uh, and all things uh, now currently SNOMED. Um, so I've worked on um, a number of national projects over the last few years. Um, and I guess of current relevance is I've been a technical advisor to Public Health England for their vaccination monitoring um, program uh, since 2006 odd. Um, which means I've had a kind of um, close to front seat ride in some of the last year's pandemic programme. Um, so maybe more of that later. Um, really, my view is as a traveller in the world of SNOMED, um, I probably more in the Land Rover than understanding how the gearbox works. So forgive me for some of my naivety here. I'm not really a technical expert necessarily, um, though I understand a bit of how, how SNOMED works. Um, I'm more interested actually in, in its implementation at the coalface. Um, so uh, as we go along, there may be stuff which uh, I will um, claim a certain degree of ignorance of. Um, this evening, um, I was asked to talk a bit about my experiences of SNOMED, um, and I'm going to do that, uh, uh, cover a number of topics along the way, and, and possibly we can just look at some of those if people want to pitch in. Um, so to understand where we're coming from, there is, of course, the context of the SNOMED transition in England. Um, but really the meat of this is more about my perspective actually as a GP and a family physician um, in England, along with working on a project called the Bridging Studies, um, which is uh, a Public Health England backed study uh, looking at the transition from the legacy terminology into SNOMED um, and, and then some other particular uh, pieces of work, which uh, we'll, we'll touch on. Um, so, really, just to move on to the context of SNOMED transition, and forgive me because I can see there are 35 people out there and I have no idea where you're from. Um, so, I'm going to make the presumption that at least um, some people uh, are from outside um, England, um, because within the UK, um, the SNOMED transition has so far only really. Um, uh, trundle down the track in within England and, and not in the other home countries. Um, so in terms of the SNOMED transition here, this is a brownfield site. Um, in other words, we have had a long history of legacy terminology uh, behind primary care computing in the UK. I, I should add, as though I'm coming to the end of my career, um, I have never used paper records. Um, so I started in general practice in the late 80s and was straight into IT systems. Uh, so I've always worked in um, uh, with electronic health records. Um, I can dimly remember the first terminology being I, I, I used was 
Oxmith and then read Forbite um, before moving on to the two, uh, working with the two major terminologies in, in, in the UK, read five byte and clinical terms version three. Um, so five byte evolved from four byte, clinical terms version three from five byte. And both of them have been in play during the 2000s and indeed to some extent could be regarded as perhaps still there. Four main clinical systems. Uh, when we headed down this transition track, um, three on read version two and one on CTD3. Um, one of those uh, has, moved, has been consigned to history uh, within the last year. And again, in terms of the SNOMED transition, um, it, it, England took the decision to convert to SNOMED in primary care by 2017, 2018, uh, and, and for the whole of um, the NHS to be um, uh, working in primarily in SNOMED by, I think it was April 2020. But of course, like all these projects, time scales slipped. Um, and, and my memory now, some five years down the track of what exactly was due when is, is perhaps a bit um, murky. Uh, for those not from the UK, um, the read version two terminology that we had uh, evolved into clinical terms version three and therefore formed a, a, a kind of, it was mapped to it. And clinical terms version three was then, became part of SNOMED. And so um, each of those terminologies, as you go from version two to CTD3 to SNOMED gets bigger and the, the, uh, the legacy terminologies um, effectively form some kind of subset within SNOMED. I have to say that the whole program was originally well announced. There was lots of central leadership, lots of information, and it meant that uh, I certainly, as a, uh, somebody being uh, along for the ride, felt I, I, I probably knew what was happening. Um, but uh, uh, perhaps things have got a bit uh, foggier since. Um, so historically, at least, the, 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 the UK edition of SNOMED um, and, and this is an earlier slide from a, a workshop a, a few years ago, hence the, the um, updated six monthly part. Um, so the UK clinical edition includes SNOMED International Release and the UK SNOMED CT Clinical Extension. But the whole UK edition includes the uh, CT Drug Extension uh, with its components being underpinned by the Dictionary of Medicines and Devices, DMV. Um, so that, th those are the kind of components we're dealing with. Um, and so coming to the implementation, um, November 2016, here was the timeline uh, and the last release of read version two in April 2016. Um, the uh, GP system suppliers had a, a year or so um, to work out their solutions. And then the last release, planned release of CTD3, clinical terms version three was April, 2018. Um, the idea being that there would be um, duplicate coding. So if you were a version two system, uh, as you move through this, started to move through this transition process, uh, you would be dual coding with both the version two and its equivalent SNOMED codes on board. And likewise, if you were a clinical terms version three, uh, uh, supplier, you would have the dual coding between CTB3 and, and SNOMED as well. Um, as I said, the, the, the codes in read version two were within the CTB3 subset, um, and, and likewise that was subsumed within SNOMED. Um, initially, the decision was that data entry would be restricted to a GP subset. Uh, and that GP subset was going to be all those uh, codes within SNOMED that had a map back to a read code. Um, now, I, I'd assumed um, as, as a kind of a passenger on this journey that um, at some point there would be an announcement that yes, um, uh, in, in fact, the GP system suppliers were now happy um, and everybody was happy in that we could then expand from uh, the 
GP subset um, in, into uh, the glorious and beneficial world of full SNOMED. Um, and I was kind of trundling along thinking, I wonder when this is going to happen. Um, and it was only at the recent UK terminology forum that somebody said, ah, oh, but we, 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 we lifted that uh, that uh, kind of restriction in 2018. So it's kind of up to the suppliers. Uh, so that was kind of a, a surprise to me. But, um, but as I said, coming back to the context, dual coding to be employed in systems, initial step only using SNOMED codes that were mapped to the legacy terminologies. But the gotchas in there was that some suppliers permitted use of synonymous codes so uh, with with the read version two um, there were there was a full set of synonyms uh, and these synonyms were sometimes conceptually equivalent and sometimes not so the whole area of recode synonyms has been interesting as we've gone down this track and also some suppliers um, permitted use of their own local codes within their own um, their own equivalent terminology. Um, so by January 20 last year, I've, it, I, I think it was almost to the day that uh, the main suppliers completed their initial move to the GP subset. Um, and, and I can remember our practice going over on the 29th of January um, last year so we kind of trundled down and the senior partner went what's all these what's all this stuff here then um, in, in her morning surgery um, and I and I seem to remember that that was neatly sandwiched between a meeting where um, I, I was part of the pandemic preparedness team um, and, and somebody had leant across saying I think we have a problem in Wuhan um, and, and the and the 31st of January, which was a couple of weeks later when, in fact, we were uh, convening a, a very rapid uh, uh, group of codes that could be implemented across the systems uh, to represent the immediate needs of, of what, was, what was happening. Um, so that move to the subset happened a year or so ago. Um, but as yet, we haven't we, we are therefore still in transition. We haven't yet moved on. And, and, and personally, and this is my personal view, um, I think there's no clarity to end users as to what happens next and to how much of SNOMED and at what pace uh, will be opened up. Um, and that kind of gives me a, a bit of a headache in, in a couple of the other roles because a lot of the work we've been doing essentially has been in full SNOMED, whereas the systems that uh, are implementing SNOMED uh, are not working in full SNOMED. They're, they're working in their own particular uh, versions and, uh, and, and subsets of SNOMED. So that, that, that was the context. Um, I don't know if there are any, uh, for those on the panel for Charles and Ian, whether any particular questions have been raised about that as kind of pause moment. Um, um. So not as yet. Uh, the one thing I meant to say at the start of this is as we're using um, Zoom webinar, you will notice uh, as participants that you can't speak. Um, so what we what we'd ask you to do is either in the QA uh, or the chat box, which are at the bottom of your screen. Uh, if you have questions as we go along, then please type them in. Um, and Charles and myself will do whatever you call moderating moderating role and raise the questions as we go along um then at the end we'll have a bit of a more uh, open session with questions and either we can ask them on your behalf or we'll turn on uh, your speaking ability so you can ask them depending on what questions we get um, um, no there are some questions Di, yes can, can I ask you one question, which I think might help us? There are there are quite a lot of international viewers, uh, and I wondered if you could just expand a little bit about the issue of local codes in 
individual GP systems? Because I think that 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 might uh, raise an eyebrow in, in people who are not familiar with um, EMIS and TGP and and the other systems that, that are available in the UK. Okay, so um, within SNOMED, there is I, I'm not quite sure how many, roughly a million. Uh, concepts, I guess, somewhere up there. Um, within read version two, uh, uh, forgive me if the figure's slightly up, but probably closer to a couple of hundred thousand. Um, and, and therefore, not all concepts, uh, but not all concepts that, for instance, might be represented in SNOMED could be represented within read um, version two. Um, as a kind of national standard terminology. So what, uh, uh, what some of the suppliers permitted was the creation of local codes. Um, and, and, and this happened in, uh, in actually one of a, a, a couple of ways. Um, uh, during the 90s, there was a free for all. You could actually create your own local codes uh, and stick them somewhere. Uh, it, it, in a hierarchy or not, have them just free floating. So if you felt that there was a requirement for something, um, for instance, I was involved in, in a lot of research projects uh, dur during the 90s, um, and we felt that we sometimes needed a code to plug a gap in a research project, we would just create them. Um, we, we, we kind of took a bit of care over it because we re obviously recognized that this could be a problem, but we would create them um, and distribute them locally. Um, but actually, as time went on, that, that restriction, uh, uh, that ability was removed. But the system suppliers might create local codes um, that didn't form part of the standard national terminology that sat there. Um, and these uh, uh, particularly for one of the system suppliers, EMIS in particular, um, they, they had a huge raft of, of local codes. And I think they spent quite a bit of time um, trying to marry these up into, the, uh, into SNOMED in one way or another. Um, I think, does that, uh, does that answer the, the, the question? Um, I, I think it helps to, to to understand what was going on and and so on. I think my sense too is that people used uh, local codes uh, to deal with kind of administrative issues in local health economies as well. Uh, so I know I know in town hamlets where I work, um, you know, all sorts of codes were in, invented either for research purposes, as you say, or to help the management of. Uh, health care exchange across uh, the practices and for quality improvement programs and so on. I, yeah, I, I think they were quite well intentioned, but oh yeah, but of course yeah, yeah. they, gave, they no. gave a real headache when, when you know by the time you come into the uh, in, in, into the snowmed world, you know, what do you do with them with these terms? Yeah. Um, so in, in, in my role as a as a GP and family physician, um, I, I think. You know, looking around me at, at, at the other coalface users in both within my practice and within my locality, I think there was a reasonable amount of information and publicity. So I think, um, you, you know, this this was well handled. So for those areas who are considering going moving across in, into SNOMED or, or, or looking at that kind of implementation, the, the amount of information that was available was, was pretty useful and very well constructed. Having said that, however, you know, I go into the practice in the morning and at most end users in, in primary care were actually ignorant of what was about to happen. Um, and um, uh, so actually when we're saying, you know, the SNOMED transition is going to happen, you know, uh, probably in the next six months, in the next month, um, they, they didn't really know what that meant. Um, uh, so terminologically, I don't think they quite got this was going to be a switch, um, you know, from uh, English to French or, or Welsh to Greek. Uh, that, that kind of didn't really click. And, and to be fair, um, they probably didn't need to know, although uh, we tried to explain that there might, you know, there might be bumps in the road. The dual coding, meaning that any time a 
concept was entered into a clinical system through a legacy terminology, read version two or CTV three, the fact that it, it, there were these maps already in existence. Um, so whilst we were still in this uh, pre-transition phase, the dual coding element meant that if a read version two code was entered, and entered into the clinical system for a patient, then its equivalent SNOMED code was created and sat there. So that really uh, has made the whole process a heck of a lot easier because it meant, you know, come transition day, um, all the data that had been sitting there in patients' historical records since um, the early 90s uh, was already uh, predominantly coded in, in, in SNOMED or equivalent codes. Um, so when it come when it came to um, uh, the actual turn on day, um, I think we, we were there and noticing heck um, some of the terms that we're used to using um, don't quite seem to have the same phrase. So um, you might enter something that had said. Uh, uh, mixed uh, anxiety and depressive disorder but actually what went th that was a kind of historical uh, concept term um, and that might be sitting there in your record uh, but then when you uh, selected that and entered it you, you'd see that it may then uh, be changed as it entered into the record in, in, into its SNOMED um, equivalent. Um, so there's kind of, an, on the first few days, there was a kind of bit of scratching of heads, but okay, this is what happens. Um, but again, on that Monday morning, most of the code selection in this new SNOMED world was of previously existing terms already sitting in a patient's historical record. So you were just picking up the diabetes mellitus or there essential hypertension from the the now SNOMED terminology um, and, and it didn't look any different. So, um, and, and if you were using uh, record artifacts to enter data, um, in, in fact, those those terms had, had been almost seamlessly um, uh, changed in, in, into their SNOMED equivalent. So 95% of term selection was really straightforward. Um, however, um, if you uh, wanted to add something that was completely new, um, a, a new data item that wasn't existing on that patient's record, you were then into the SNOMED browser. And, and, and this really did, um, it, it, it had changed from what was previously a fairly simple um, uh, 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 code browser into something that actually you went from a mini into something that was probably equivalent to a Ferrari um, uh, and a Formula One at that. So we had this new browser with new hierarchies. Um, and, and actually, if you were looking for some old familiar terms, urinary tract infection, it wasn't there. You couldn't find it. Um, so you had to learn or relearn searching techniques. Um, and there was also a shunt, um, and, and you can see this now, that whereas before a lot of us were used to using diagnostic terms to represent the, uh, a patient's condition in front of us, uh, we couldn't easily find those anymore. Um, we, we were moving from diagnostic terms to, to SNOMED finding terms. Um, there's a lot more usage of um, on examination, um, uh, 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 swollen legs, or, or, or sorry, we're not an examination, clinical finding of swollen legs. Forgive me for, for flipping into a hybrid between the read world and the cinema world. Um, uh, and, and for read version two users, quite often when we were code selecting before, we would actually use the code to just restrict our choices and, and, and make it a bit easier to find code selections. And, and so shifting from that simple mono hierarchy in read version two, um, using codes and, and that hierarchy, it, it, it was harder to find co uh, codes, particularly if you ended up um, moving up and down the full SNOMED hierarchy. Um, so uh, 
actually on screen at the moment. Um, I've got in, in the background, and forgive me for this, we, we were having a few battles uh, prior to this and getting the right on screen presentation. So if I type in urinary tract infection into the, um, into the, the SNOMED browser, whereas previously the top code would have come up, would have been urinary tract infection. Now, uh, it, it, it didn't immediately appear. Uh, and so that was a problem. And as you look down here, we had suspected UTI, recurrent UTI, UTI and pregnancy utility managers. Um, if you then um, typed in urinary tract, um, you would have a very similar list. And down the bottom here was acute urinary tract infection, which was the equivalent of what previously had been a um, UTI in our read system. So there was a bit of learning to going on about finding where the terms were. And over the last year, we have learned that actually, if you want UTI, um, if you type acute uh, URI, you'll end up with just a very simple three code selection, um, which, which then makes it easier. But this is a learning process, um, which perhaps not all the older physicians amongst us have got there. Um, so, the code selection was an initial problem for us, um, but with a little bit of hand holding, we were kind of uh, pointing individuals in our practice to roughly where the most appropriate codes would be. Uh, and, and don't forget, the other thing is that we'd been using this uh, legacy terminology for 20 years or so. Um, sorry, close to 30 years, actually, uh, 30 years or so. Um, and, and therefore we knew a lot of these things backwards. Um, and it is a bit like finding your favorite book uh, has had all the chapters shuffled uh, and turned upside down and, and partially translated into another language. Um, so it, it was slightly dis disconcerting, but we're, we're getting there. The next uh, little gremlin along the way was, uh, okay, we've got data entry, but uh, a lot of the things that happen in practice relate to um, uh, data extraction. And uh, within England, uh, in particular, the UK, historically, to some extent, uh, we have a lot of national audit programs, uh, the, the most high profile of which probably was the quality and outcomes framework, uh, abbreviated to COF. Uh, and what this effectively is, is a, um, a, a financial inducement package to uh, try and improve the quality of care and primary care. So for instance, for a topic such as diabetes, you might be paid uh, a, a certain uh, amount of money for ensuring that all your diabetics have had uh, the appropriate blood tests done, they've had foot checks done, blood pressure measured, and that the uh, number of patients where their uh, glycosylated hemoglobin is met to target, um, that you're achieving certain um, uh, certain targets. Of course, all these data extraction elements depend on specifications and code clusters uh, or, and ref sets. Um, and we started to find that, that in some of these, we were getting some odd results in, in the data extraction and, and in all the, the ongoing routine monitoring of these, these processes. Um, and I'm going to give you one example on the screen here. So um, the, uh, here are three separate read codes, um, H30 with the term bronchitis unspecified, H30Z, bronchitis not otherwise specified, and H3, uh, 3120 chronic asthmatic bronchitis. Now, H30, um, bronchitis unspecified is mapped to this SNOMED tone over here, bronchitis mm -hmm. disorder, as is bronchitis NOS. Um, but bronchitis unspecified also had some synonyms, and these are represented by H30.11, chest infection, unspecified bronchitis, pretty similar, and that mapped across in this direction. Uh, but it had another synonym, which was H30.12, recurrent wheezy bronchitis. And so this, this had quite a bit of traction and usage. Um, and this was mapped across to 
chronic asthmatic bronchitis in Thomid. Now, whilst this particular term was not part of the original uh, COF ref set or code cluster um, relating to asthma, this one is. So post-transition, all of a sudden, everybody who had this term sitting uh, in their record popped up in this cluster. Uh, and, and we, of course, were paid on the how where well we were managing and reviewing our asthmatics. But anybody who had this particular term, of course, wouldn't have been perceived as being an asthmatic necessarily. Um, so we started to find some glitches along the way. Um, so th th there's a couple of perspectives. Um, looking at it from where I stand now, uh, a year post transition, um, the different suppliers, IT suppliers, and there are two big ones within England um, and, and a third smaller one, they, they've actually implemented Snow, SnowMed at different rates because for various reasons, they each face different challenges. Um, and both of them handle uh, the UK SnowMed updates in different ways. So both of them are actually running on different versions of SnowMed at the moment. Um, and whilst uh, if a patient moves from uh, being in a practice using one system across to a practice using a, the, uh, an alternative system, um, their record tra is transferred in SnowMed, um, there are mechanisms in place to ensure that uh, the appropriate codes should get implemented in, in, in the other system. They, they are actually implemented implementing and using slightly different hierarchies, which, which is a bit of a headache for those of us working on national projects. Um, having said all that, of course, COVID landed slap bang on top of this. Um, and this has obviously affected a lot of the timelines around SNOMED implementation. But I have to say there was, there's been a, you know, exemplary coordinated central terminological approach to COVID over the last year. Um, Although I, I, I suspect we're about to, to have a kind of iceberg moment um, as the UK's uh, um, it, edition of, uh, or, or, of SNOMED um, engages with the latest update from um, uh, the international edition. Um, but then to go on, um, due to the complexity of the hierarchical changes in in, in a lot of the embedded utilities. So whether we have um, data entry screens with value sets or uh, we have uh, pre-authored uh, Word documents that contain coded data uh, or, or searches, um, one of the GP suppliers has not actually adopted recent SNOMED updates. So it, it, it's quite a bit out of tune. Um, and of course this then gives us as end users a bit of a challenge is we have built a lot of bespoke uh, in, in, in internal artifacts using um, the, the, uh, the existing hierarchies. And these may have to be changed where the hierarchies themselves have been updated. Um, and, and, and how we all handle this at the moment, we're on twice yearly-ish um, updates. How we all handle this if, if the updates shift to monthly is, is going to be a bit of a challenge. Um, so I, just uh, pause for a moment whether or not there's any uh, any particular questions that have arisen. Um, so one question that um, a colleague of mine, because uh, they're in Europe, so Teresa from Ireland asks, is I think so I'll, I'll have a perspective on this because I used to work um, for the central um, body in the UK on terminology, um, as will Charles because he was involved in uh, the national program and obviously yourself as kind of the the end user if you like so what was the driver to move to snowmed in primary care and i'll let you answer first Di, and then you can chip in charles um i uh i think there's a phrase in english about done too as opposed <laughs> <laughs> um uh it, it was a central decision and uh, and you know, there are moments in the middle of the night in my national world of authoring SNOMED specs when I think, hmm, I, I, I kind of wish I was back in the old world. But you know, I, I fully understand where 
the reasons behind it. So at this point, I handle I, I, I'll hand over to Charles. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I, well, I think that the, the, there is a sort of, if you like, um, overarching informatics reason, which is that a long time ago, right at the beginning of the national program for IT, a decision was made to implement SNOMED as the universal um, terminology for all healthcare in the UK um, uh, and, uh, and England in particular. Um, and some of the logic of that just goes back to the fact that England and, and the US were essentially the funders and creators of the first uh, genuine SNOMED uh, um, um, uh, solutions, if you like. Uh, of course, ma the major investment came from the US uh, through the National Library of Medicine. Um, but, uh, but if you were to drill down, why, why would you do this? I, I mean, I, I, I sit in, a, a, in a, a, a hospital where to this day, we still can't exchange uh, data items with our primary care colleagues. We can see that, you know, we have a fantastically good health information exchange uh, system in East London that allows me to see uh, all of the structured data from uh, primary care and, uh, and you know, something like 400 practices, uh, mental health trusts, uh, social care organizations, uh, hospices and so on. But I can't actually, you know, if Di, if Di was in a practice in East London uh, and I wanted to send him over a SNOMED, uh, some sort of code and say, hey, would you like to stick that in your system, Di? At the moment, uh, uh, you still can't do it, and you certainly couldn't have done it in the old regime of, uh, of read codes and so on. So I think the journey is taking us to that point where it is possible to exchange structured data and uh, use it to populate records at, for direct care. And then really critically, and I think COVID has really shown this, how much simpler it is if you want to do um, major data investigations of things that are happening to large populations, how much simpler it is if you're working from a single vocabulary. Uh, and I've seen that glaringly over this last year with uh, uh, SNOMED CT codes for COVID-19, COVID vaccination, and so on. And it has simplified our lives massively. So I think, if you like, that's the underlying reason why you would, why you would uh, change to a universal terminology. And I think in England, it, it all started really because primary care was already coded and us in secondary care um, are still using uh, quills and pieces of paper. I mean, that, that's not universally true, but the transition to using uh, um, uh, enterprise-wide electronic healthcare record systems in every hospital is still uh, a work in progress. Uh. <clears throat> Okay, I'm not going. To, I'm not going to add anything to this. No, um, <laughs> so for a variety of reasons. Um, we have one other question, but I'd like to leave that uh, to the end and let you get through your presentation first, Di, if that's okay. Okay. I, I mean, one other thing I would say is that actually, the the, the having co good coded primary care records has allowed primary care in the UK to develop at a much faster pace and and, and keep up really over the last. Um, 30 years uh, and, 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 and has enabled stuff to happen that couldn't have happened before. And that's, you know, that's, that's brought tremendous benefits to the ability to care for our patients um, and, and probably taken a great deal of work actually off, off, off secondary care um, because of what we've been able to do. Um, actually, one thing I was I just, uh, just did looking at today was actually the, sh the shift in data recording and, and actually how we're using uh, concepts within the practice. And, you know, we're a year downstream. Has there actually been any shift in how we uh, capture data? And, and the answer is yes. 
Um, if we went back to 2019 and we looked at the percentage of uh, codes that were entered in day-to-day -day usage uh, uh, around consultations, 50% um, of them came from the disorders chapter or the disorders element of, of, um, of, of, of SNOMED. Um, actually, a year downstream, and I appreciate this is probably partly skewed by COVID as well, but I, I, I think it's true. I think it's a genuine shift. Now, that, that figure is now down closer to 34, 35%. So there's been a kind of reduction um, of, a, of about a third um, in the use of disorder terms in, in you know as frontline usage in in, in uh, certainly in, in in my practice and I can see that happening elsewhere um, but okay to move on a little bit to, to this part um, a part of my work is uh, and, and our team's work is involved in um, underpinning public health England's vaccination program so what we're asked to do every year is to write a national specification um, that is given out to the system suppliers um, to uh, to get uh, to assist them in capturing data around vaccination programs. Maybe straightforward for a simple childhood vaccination, but when you're looking at things like um, the flu program and vaccinating individuals who are at increased risk because of their clinical uh, uh, the, their clinical phenotype, um, you uh, it, it becomes quite a complex specification of trying to identify those people who are deemed to be at higher risk, whether they're diabetic or they're immune deficient or have ischemic heart disease. Um, certainly within, within the UK, we're trying to vaccinate those at-risk groups where we're, where we're not already vaccinating individuals because of age. Um, and uh, so, for instance, the the... Uh, the broad ref set or, or, or code library relating to flu extends to some 19 and a half thousand uh, individual terms. Um, so it, it, it's quite a beast um, and, and we've been kind of running this for some years. Obviously with this transmission transition from the legacy terminologies to SNOMED, um, the data that is uh, that Public Health England run their vaccination programs on, they, they were concerned that actually there could be a problem somewhere along the way um, in how data is captured or extracted um, that might skew their, uh, their vaccination monitoring program. In other words, saying this year, okay, we're vaccinating 85% of, uh, of, of individuals with, with these conditions, uh, and and uh, they were wanting to have a degree of confidence that there weren't shifts that were artifactually brought in just through the term terminology change. So what we created was something called the Bridging Studies Programme, which uh, took a number of conditions and concepts uh, uh, and uh, uh, code clusters or ref sets and actually monitored those over a two year period prior to the SNOMED transition uh, with the idea that we would then monitor it for a year uh, 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 during the transition and then for a year after the, 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 the completion of the program. Um, and the idea was then to see if there were any particular uh, problems that were uh, thrown up. So here, here is uh, on, on the screen now is, is an example where we're tracking a, an individual code usage in a practice. This is actually number of patients on a, a over time. This is a month by month basis. Um, and the you can see that there is a step increase here in the recording of bronchitis as, uh, unspecified here. Um, and this step increase um, occurs um, in and around the time of the, um, the, the uh, SNOMED transition. Um, it, actually looking further down here is this is actually looking at, um, at th these are actually numbers of patients, these are percentages, uh, and this is um, within, um, this one is actually within the practice, this is across the whole IT system, so 
two major suppliers, this is actually averaging out. And you can see that this is kind of drift and they're not just within the practice, but across the, the whole uh, the whole estate for this particular GP system supplier, there is a step change around that time. Um, so, um, and, and here is another example, um, and this one relates to um, actually to asthma. Uh, and what we have here is a representation of how many patients within the practice um, have one of the uh, have an asthma code or, or one of its children within read version two. Uh, and then the step here is where we've moved over to a SNOMED extraction. Uh, and you can see that there is a step in the SNOMED extraction. And, and that is because all of these terms down here uh, had sat outside of this H33 hierarchy. Um, uh, but they all sat within the SNOMED equivalent hierarchy. Um, and, and this is, it was one of the reasons why we, we had problems also with the COAF uh, uh, audit program as well, was this step change suddenly occurred. Um, the other thing I'd just like to draw your attention to is that um, as we're trundling along here, there is um, this little green dot. And within England, uh, actually, and, and some of the other home countries, we had a standard data extraction system called MyQuest that you could plug into any of the GP system suppliers uh, and you plug the query in and you would get the same answer out of the system. So they, they all had to be historically compliant with this data extraction tool. What we recognized was that this tool would not work post SNOMED transition uh, in theory. Uh, and, and the uh, the center had decided to let it drift uh, um, for whatever reason. So we, we actually had here um, a change in what, what's happening here is there is a change in data extraction technique going on as well. Now you might say that is that's artifactual, but actually the problem it also exists for data extraction techniques um, in general for organizations such as Public Health England is uh, it, it, it's not just that the we might be extracting different codes, but the actual extraction techniques themselves might shift, as well as end users may be putting in different terms of code. So there's a multifactorial thing going on here. Um, and one other aspect I, I, I would like to draw people's attention to um, um, is that historically within our legacy systems, there were very rarely any hierarchical shifts. Uh, what would happen is we'd have new codes coming out for sure, but it would take time for those new codes to be used. But there was never a hierarchical shift. Within SNOMED, of course, you do get hierarchical shifts and they do matter. Um, so this is an example here um, of a pair of queries. Uh, um, we ran these a couple of weeks ago. So this is where uh, we ran this query, which is the original query, uh, and um, it, it, in, in, its, uh, in its original state. And this picked up 330 patients with this particular uh, clinical uh, condition. But the second query is identical to the top one, except it contains all the related hierarchical shifts. And you can see that there is, um, there, there is this tremendous drop in the number of uh, identified patients. Um, and, and in this case, there's the reverse, there's a small increase in, in the number of identified patients. Now, we, uh, across the whole bridging studies, we, we've got quite a few of these, uh, and, and it was only a small number of these where the hierarchical shift actually had an impact. But the underlying thing is, it does matter, and we therefore do have to um, work out when these shifts are happening, and we have to handle them. Um, so I, I, I think the kind of bottom line of this is that the broad results, the majority of the areas are happily stable. They trundle along. Um, uh, and, and actually in this practice, the, the actual deployment going live of SNOMED is actually somewhere in this red bit here. Um, so it's a couple of months after this transition. So, so far, the 
at the, the actual going live it hasn't impacted on the, the data recording it's only the uh, the data extractions and, and the specifications going on around now i'm aware it's, it, it's 10 to 9. um so actually I, i'm just going to wrap up in a couple of minutes um very briefly um we as a team in primus have been authoring specs for a long time there was an awful lot of work to do um, around this, building bespoke tools, trying to plan ahead, uh, getting workshops where we had uh, interested parties coming on, trialing specifications, um, uh, and actually having to think ahead about how Snowmade handle, you know, it, it's got to be adaptable to be the terminology of the future. It's got to have the ability to retire codes that are inappropriate to shift hierarchies it's fundamentally it's uh, you know one of its major raison d'etre um, but we had to work out how as specification writers how we handle the retirement of codes how we handle all the tooling that goes on behind the scene um, and, and there were an awful lot of lessons learned that maybe we can return to another day, uh, which include all the thing problems around using Excel and sure that the data formats are right, uh, comparison with similar existing clusters, local to international. Um, so far, the SNOMED updates uh, are occurring twice a year, we've managed to handle. But I think if this starts shifting to monthly, that, that's going to be an issue for us. Uh, particularly if there are major national programs that are going to uh, be impacted on uh, close to a, 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 a SNOMED update that may or may not be implemented by one or other of the suppliers. Um, I haven't talked much around the drug uh, dictionaries, um, but I, the, these things I wanted to say. These are general points for specification authoring, and some of these lessons have come out of the last year working with COVID. Um, if you've got a code cluster, you need, you must have a detailed scope about what that represents and a definition of what it represents. Um, and for a lot of clusters, you might be able to get away with being a generalist, um, as I have done for some time. But for, for quite a few, you do need a clinical terminologist and a clinical domain specialist to try and work out from the detailed scope what exactly you, is going to go into that rest set. You know, what is to me as a generalist, you know, I try to work out what is the impact of C3 deficiency in the context of immune suppression? No idea, right? you know. Um, Wikipedia is great at times, but sometimes you do need to have an expert behind you. Uh, and sometimes you do need to go back to the owner or sponsor of a spec. And, and the reality is these, these, the owners, the people who decide we're going to have this data extraction, all the shielded patients. Um, okay, let's define that within the room. You actually need a clinical terminologist in the room then to say, this is possible or this is not. Uh, and, and you're gonna have to think hard about a couple of these aspects. Otherwise they throw it over the wall and you look at this and you can say, it ain't gonna run. Um, and, and, and as a terminologist, you do need to have an understanding about the context this thing's gonna run. So where are the next generation of terminologists coming from? A lot of them are fairly long in the tooth. Um, is there a coherent plan for development of SNOMED in the UK? What's the impact of monthly updates going to be? I have to say that the distribution of COVID codes during the pandemic with their associated use cases and their definitions has been really, really helpful. Um, and finally, the sharing of ref sets and code libraries with the appropriate support documentation telling you what it is, that's got to be beneficial, but it has to be funded. And, and at that point, I'm going to end. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs> um, so I... Well, in fact, I have, one, I have one question from Pete Turnbull, who you'll know, um, because Pete works in the UK, um, on SNOMED. So in terms of the queries, are there differences in numbers in your queries between false positives, false negatives? Have you found any uh, obvious links, I guess, in terms of your approach? Um, well, if we look at the bridging studies, um, we deliberately built 
it in the knowledge of we, we knew there were bodies buried in with some of these terms. And so in fact, we honed in on some of these, uh, particularly where they might be relevant to um, the, the the core program around vaccination monitoring. So we knew there were bodies there. Um, so we thought we'd just go and, and, and actually demonstrate as we move along. Um, I have to say we haven't, you know, the, the, the study's still going on. Um, so we haven't published the, the, the data yet. So I'm just giving you some snapshots from it. Um, Yes, there are false positives. Yes, there are false negatives. And to your, I suppose to your other points, um, which is something that uh, I know Charles has a view on, as do I. Um, I mean, in terms of the biggest challenge is always getting suppliers to move to new versions in a, I'll call it orderly fashion, for the want of a better way of putting it. Um, certainly in the UK, some of that, is trying to be always being mitigated against the use of a national terminology server, which therefore gives you access to the latest version. Um, it also gives you access to your last point there about a way to share reference sets and code libraries um, in a more productive way. Mm -hmm. One of the issues with sharing ref sets is the versioning of ref sets. So which version of SNOMED is your ref set aligned to, um, which is always a challenge. If you do that through a terminology server, then you're always seeing the up-to-date version. But Charles, do you want to add to that? Uh, no, I, I think that sums up uh, my thinking very much at the moment. Uh, I suppose the only thing I would add, and, and maybe uh, Dai uh, wants to sort of uh, kind of build on this, is which I think at the moment, the discussion has focused very much on uh, data entry and and uh, and and the sort of the issues of choosing codes, the difference between different choices, and so on. Uh, some of this gets resolved, of course, by better analytical tools. And I, in part of the answer, I think, is where the next generation of clinical terminologies comes with a comment, which is the, the next generation of data scientists are beginning to think about use of, um, of SNOMED and of course get very excited uh, about the use of expression constraint language, the ability to define code sets using expression constraints and the syntactical um, uh, parts of, of, of SNOMED. And I, I think uh, the next generation of terminologists may well come uh, from that group, but with with a sort of clinical background, uh, I, either from 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 medicine or actually from nursing and other healthcare professions. So I'm, I I think they will emerge actually, and us old blokes will just get kicked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. you're not old yet, Ian, but I am. I'm not that far <laughs> behind you. Um, so I, I, tend, I tend to agree with you. I think the, there's a move, in some ways, there's a move that clinical terminology should be part of um, healthcare professionals' training, if you like. So um, all healthcare professionals should have an understanding of clinical terminology. That doesn't mean they are clinical terminologists. But I think a good understanding of that is helpful both from the point of view of um, one understanding why they're recording things in the way they're doing it. So most, most humans are fairly predictable. If there's a benefit, most people will do what's right um, with a few exceptions. Um, then I think you're right uh, where what Charles has said about you know, clinical analytics um, as a, or analysts as a group of people are then looking at making the most of that data. And then there will be you know, the, the central boffins, if you like, around the clinical terminologists who actually maintain the clinical terminology and therefore do need to understand. But I think you, you need to increase both levels. I think there's a, the, the crusty old bit in terms of clinical terminologies, I agree with you and I include myself in that group. Um, I think the, the data analysts is, is a group which is expanding um, as the benefits of SNOMED become more visible. 
the healthcare professionals is uh, a work in progress in a number of uh, countries globally, of which the UK is one, but certainly isn't the only one, I would say. Actually, I'd add one, uh, there's something else here. And, and that is, um, we, you know, we had 30 years experience in, in the legacy terminology. And, and we, we could slot its errors, and, you know, its quirks and its problems. And we we very quick, you know, we, we learned how to handle it. And I think at the moment we're getting to grips with SNOMED and, and some people have been getting to grips with it for longer than others. Um, and um, the more we use it, the more uh, familiarity we have it, the, the better the terminology will be. We will, uh, you know, I, Along, the, along this route we have taken as a, as a team, we have flushed out some of the, the quirks uh, as, as, as we've moved along. Uh, and, and the more we use it, the more the whole terminology gets used. I think it, it will become more useful. Um, and you know, we're, we're starting as a team to explore with aspects, aspects of it that we, we haven't thought about before. We, we're starting to get into areas other than just um, looking at Okay, give me the the, the keywords and, and, and the concept uh, phrase. We're starting to look at actually this thing is a you know there's a degree of decision logic in here with attributes and maybe we should start to be analysing the attributes around to give us better um, you know better returns for, for for what we're putting in. I think I mean the the one the one common. Um, well, not common, but one of the questions which um, came up in the chat and in the QA um, highlights the link between primary care and secondary care. And the one thing that um, I'd add about that, which is um, I find interesting because in my background, I've worked in both primary care and secondary care. Um, I'll call it in the data field, but in, in both in both senses in some ways. Um, I think it's interesting when you start looking within the UK where you've got particularly things like um, diabetic, um, you've got diabetic registers, which give you a lot of detail about a diabetic patient over time, which is not necessarily um, when they've had problems, but also highlights the huge periods of time in between when they don't have problems. And then you've obviously got the more detailed um, inpatient data Bringing those two together gives you a really important view of that patient, um, which is very important when you're treating them to actually understand how that disease um, develops over time. That's becoming, as we move forward, more important in some ways when we start looking at moving into genomics, into personalized medicine, when you're not just collecting diagnosis. So to one of the, the questions earlier, you're not just collecting ICD-10 codes. It's not about diagnosis um, or just diagnosis. It's about diagnosis, it's about findings, uh, it's about procedures, but then broader than that. So you start looking at the, the social determinants of health, you're looking at drugs, you're looking at substances, um, you know, local financial issues, environmental issues, the whole lot comes into play. That takes you way beyond any normal classification of disease. Um, so I think just in terms of the way we're moving forward, I think the, the longer term picture is more about having a single terminology, which was certainly the drive within the national program in the UK, really for that reason, to kind of break down um, some of the challenges which come along with interoperability, which we've had in the UK for years, as has um, elsewhere globally. Um, so uh, we, as we're past the top of the hour now, we'll stop there. So do you have any uh, closing remarks, Guy? No, thank you for um, putting up with me for so long. I kind of... <laughs> and, uh, and, um, it was a pleasure. The pleasure was all ours. Um, Charles, do you want to add any final remarks? Uh, well, I would like to thank Di for a really uh, stimulating and and uh, interesting talk, which I think you know has 
has revealed some of the struggles that many of us have experienced in one way or another in, in whichever part of the healthcare system in in England that we um, that we work in. Uh, so I've learned a lot this evening, uh, and uh, I've also had some interesting chats with people in the sidebar. So thanks to them, and thanks for, as always, to Pete Turnbull for uh, helping us clarify our minds and so on. So I think a, a great session, uh, brilliantly led by Di. So thank you very much. So thank you, Di. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks for the uh, participants attending this evening. I hope you found it uh, useful and stimulating. And uh, all being well, we'll see you in a month's time for the next clinical webinar. So thank you and good night or good day or good afternoon, depending on where you are. Take care.